welcome to Delivering Miracles, a podcast to teach women like you tips and strategies on how you can have a safer pregnancy so you can bring home a healthy baby. I'm your host and your high-risk pregnancy expert, Farijat Deshpande. I can't wait to chat with you. I met my husband, gosh, I guess it's been it's been a decade now, a little more than a decade. It's a long time. I didn't realize it's been so long. I met him a, a little over a decade ago, and one night, I remember we were talking on the phone. I was still in grad school, and he was already out of grad school and working. And, you know, we were just generally talking. It was really, really early. It wasn't even a relationship at that point. So we were still getting to know each other. We were talking about what movies we'd seen recently and what TV shows we were watching during the week. And the conversation was about wrapping up or so. And I said, okay, well, I need to get going. I need to get back to my reading. And so he asked naturally, oh, what are you reading? And I responded without even thinking. I said, oh, I'm reading On Death and Dying. And he was completely silent. And I was like, oh, God, what, what happened? What, what, did we get cut off or did I say something wrong? What happened? It didn't even occur to me how that might come across to someone who didn't have this natural interest and fascination with grief and mourning as much as I do. And finally, he spoke up and he's like, uh, you're reading what? And I could tell he was trying really hard to be supportive and not let me see or hear just how thrown off he was by that. And but I was so flustered by that. I could feel my face burning up and I was so embarrassed. And I was like, oh, I it's, uh, 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 it's I'm reading it for my thesis, my graduate thesis on cross-cultural grief and mourning practices. And I just kind of rambled on about all this stuff. And I, it was just one of those moments you'd see on TV where you're like, oh, just stop talking, just stop talking. But he was so great about it. He has such a great sense of humor. He's like, that's not helping. And we both just cracked up and it lessened the the tension that I was feeling, and it just kind of got us back on the same page. And it's a story that he tells all the time whenever we talk about how we met or early parts of our relationship, because he's always found it so interesting. And he's so curious about the fact that I'm so fascinated to and drawn to topics of grief and bereavement. And it's it's not in like a dark, sadistic kind of way. I just find it really interesting from a psychological perspective, what happens when we lose somebody that's close to us and how we process that. And he always talks about how I'm I'm the really weird weird girl who loves to read about death, but I always shoot back and say, "Well, you still married me anyway." So what does that really say about what's going on over here? So I know I'm you know I'm making light of a very serious topic, but I want you to really understand through this episode today that grief and mourning are natural parts of the circle of life. All of us have lost somebody at some point. All of us will continue to lose loved ones at some point. But losing a child is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult emotional experience you can endure, no matter how far along you are in your pregnancy or how old your child is. And that's something that we're going to talk about today. So fast forward several years from that crazy conversation, I did obviously uh, didn't scare him off enough and we were married and uh, we had, I think my son had just been born and I was shifting away from my therapy practice and I was getting ready to launch my high risk pregnancy business, which I have now. And I joined an online business building marketing type class. And it was a group class and we had group calls. And on one of the calls, I heard this really lovely woman with a very gentle voice raise a question about how to build a program for women and couples who are grieving the loss of a baby. And I swear my eyes bugged out of my head, like that emoji, you know, that has the hearts coming out for eyes. 
Because not only was she talking about grief, which, as you now know, I find very interesting, but it was also something that I'm super passionate about in a field that I was just starting to build a business in. I knew that this was going to come up because women with high-risk pregnancies many times experience pregnancy loss. And so I knew I needed to talk to her. And as you'll see, she was also motivated to expand her career just like I was because of her own personal experiences. And she realized that required unique and specialized support. And she figured out a way to do that. So we connected. And she's one of my biggest supporters. And I learned so much from her every single time I talk to her. And I'm super excited to introduce you to my friend and colleague, Dr. Tara May. Clinical psychologist, Dr. Tara May, she is a leading expert in helping parents find comfort, hope, and healing after perinatal loss and trauma. After struggling for years following her own pregnancy loss and then facing the near death of her son, Dr. May finally discovered the tools for moving through her suffering into a place of peace, connection, and joy. Having gone from debilitating fear and sadness and into a place of courage and unshakable strength, Dr. May felt called to focus her professional activities to help other parents around the world. In the 20 years that she's been helping clients transform their lives, she now reaches thousands of families worldwide through her YouTube videos, online support group, and grief healing programs. The most quoted words from her clients are, I wish I had found you sooner. She maintains a private psychotherapy practice in Vancouver, Washington, and loves spending her personal time connecting with her family through adventures and snuggles. I'm so excited to introduce you to Dr. Tara May. Welcome, Tara. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. And thank you so much for such a lovely and warm introduction. Um, I too am your biggest supporter and I love the work that you do because it is so important and there's not enough of us out there sharing this message of hope in a time when life can feel so dark. Yes, absolutely. And I just, you know, it was one of those moments I, rem I will never forget the moment I heard you on that call going, I need to meet her. Like she's she is someone out there. I have to meet her because I just love what you do. So I'd love if you can share with us a little bit about your story and what brought you to do this work to help women and couples navigate this awful experience of grief after losing a child. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I personally feel that I have the best job in the world because I get to accompany people during the literally darkest moments of their life and into a place where they can move through suffering and really find meaning and purpose and joy and healing in their lives. And that's, to me, that's amazing. And when I talk to people and when I meet people kind of socially um, and they ask me what I do and they ask me what I specialize in, usually it's a conversation stopper. <laughs> <laughs> right, you do what? Okay. No one, no one wants to talk about death and no one certainly wants to talk about babies dying. Right. It's really not about the natural order of things. But the reason that I'm so passionate about it is because obviously I've had my own personal experience. So about 11 years ago, my husband and I had always imagined we would have two children. And, you know, and when you're young and naive, <laughs> you just assume that whatever you want is going to unfold that way. <laughs> and so we, you know, I prepared for getting pregnant and um, ate all the right foods. I avoided anything that might have been even remotely unhealthy because I was going to give this baby the best environment possible. So I got pregnant. I took care of my body. I was super excited about the idea that we were going to have this baby and our lives were going to change and it was going to be amazing. And I was not prepared, however, even though I knew intellectually that babies could die. Um, but you kind of figure like after your kind of 12 week window, most people think that they're in this kind of safe zone. Right. And culturally, we need to believe that. 
and need to believe that tragedy happens across the street or down the road or <laughs> far away, not on our doorstep. So despite the fact that I was a psychologist and I certainly am no stranger to trauma and all kinds of awful things that happen to people, I was certainly shocked when my baby died at 20 weeks. I was not prepared for that. And I was not prepared for feeling crushed emotionally. I mean, when people say their lives felt shattered, I finally understood exactly what that meant. I couldn't imagine how we were gonna pick up the pieces. I couldn't imagine how we were going to actually create the family that we had envisioned because I couldn't imagine going through it again. There must not have been even a word to, to capture how you felt because really, yeah. devastating, awful, I mean, they just seem so light in comparison to what that must have felt like. Yeah, I mean, it really, I mean, I was mowed down <laughs> emotionally and it was pretty shocking actually, the level of grief and feeling out of control, crying. I literally, and I tell my clients this all the time, I basically wore sunglasses for the first three months because I cried constantly. <laughs> Yeah. If I didn't have a client in front of me, I was crying. <laughs> it was that awful. And I and knew I believe it. that it was life changing and I didn't want it to be. And I say, that say more about that. I'm curious about how you knew it was life changing, but you didn't want it to be. Can you yeah. expand on that a bit? Yeah, you know, I think it was the psychologist in me knew that this was, there was no turning back. Like this was a major division now in my life before this happened and after this happened. And I know that when you have life-changing, altering events, it's painful. Yeah. <laughs> and everything you thought you knew gets called into question. And I did not want to face that because I knew it was gonna be hard and it was just gonna suck. And that I was in for a long road of pain and I did not want to deal with that. Yeah, it's but almost like you can see the fire you have to walk through and there's no other way through it. Exactly. But you just don't want to. Yes, and so I tried really hard to avoid the flames, to wear like, <laughs> a special suit, to walk through them, to... <laughs> you know, try to throw some water. I mean, I tried all kinds of things. And the reality is, is that you have to go through it. There's yeah. no other way and you can avoid it, but it will be waiting for you. Right. Because there's no way to go forward other than through the flames. It's just a exactly. matter of when. Yes, absolutely. So I tried, you know, I sort of danced with this fire for a while. And I went on to get pregnant and subsequently had two children. And um, when my son was, when my oldest son was four, we found out that he was going to have to have brain surgery. Mm. Now, mind you, I was super anxious. I mean, I thought I had done my grief work, you know, cause I was living, I was, you know, having fun in my life. I was living with purpose. But as soon as anything came up about my daughter who died, I would crumble. And so, but I thought that was normal because everyone says, you know, you don't get over the loss of a child. So I figured this was as good as it got. So I basically didn't talk about it, but I had a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety, which completely erupted when I found out my son was gonna have brain surgery. So in the time leading up to his surgery, I was a wreck. I was convinced he was gonna die. Mm -hmm. I would envision him dying. I was looking, I was desperate for control. So I was horrible to live with because no matter what he did, I was afraid he was gonna cause a brain event that was gonna kill him. Now, mind you, he was four. <laughs> kind of hard to rein in a four-year-old. So yeah, it, it is. So really, really hard year. So we get to the, the day of the brain surgery. I kind of accessed a lot of support and where they do this procedure to make the surgery safer. So I'm actually not that bad that day because I'm thinking tomorrow is gonna be awful. Tomorrow is when they're going to do like this major surgery on him. So, you know, my husband and I are just hanging out in the waiting room and, you know, reading some books and that kind of stuff. 
and it's taking a little longer than we anticipated. So my husband's getting a little antsy, but I'm like in total denial and I'm just like, oh, it's fine. <laughs> I'm reading. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, three fully gowned surgeons come into the waiting room. Now, if you've ever been in a waiting room for someone in surgery, you know that's not a good sign. But in my trying to be optimistic here, I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe they um, fixed the problem and he wouldn't have to have surgery the next day. <laughs> so then they move us into the private room, which is really, really bad sign, where they tell us that, in fact, um, they nicked an artery during this procedure that was supposed to make the surgery safer. And it caused a brain hemorrhage and that my son was intubated and that they didn't know if he was going to wake up. Oh my God. Yeah. So it was devastating. And that experience taught me so much. Now I will tell you, my son did survive and he is thriving. He's now a nine year old boy and is just like the happiest kid. But in that moment, I was really struck and left with this awful feeling that if he dies, I've wasted the last year of his life being anxious and worrying about this very thing instead of living with him, instead of enjoying him. And that was really a turning point because in that recognition, I, I thought, I can't live like this. I cannot let my fear of grief, my fear of that fire, rule my life. And that's what it had, it had been doing. So that night I was in the shower and I was breaking down and I vowed that I would do whatever it took, whatever it took to build my resilience, to grieve the loss of my daughter and now the potential loss of my son. And that I would do whatever it took to find my strength, to find my courage, so that I could really live life and not have a regret like I had that day. And I have. Oh, that is so, I mean, I have chills just listening to you. And I, and I know you've shared this story with me before and still every time I hear it, I just get chills because I can feel the transformation mm. that you went through. And what you say is so important. I think it deserves to be said again, which is that you, you were, anxious and worried and you weren't living mm -hmm. yes. yes i mean that just is so powerful to me because i think you're right that so many of us are so afraid of grieving or don't want to or don't need to believe it's not something we need to deal with yeah but yet it's impacting every day of our life in this anxiety because in the back of our head or sometimes in the front of our head, we think this could happen again. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm, wow. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know a lot of people who are listening can really relate because loss of a child, no matter when that loss happens, whether you're five weeks pregnant whether you're 20 weeks pregnant, whether you have a five-year-old, a 25-year-old, it guts you. Yeah. And Absolutely. it changes you. And it's something that we just don't talk about enough, especially when the loss happens during pregnancy, even early in pregnancy. I, I lost our first baby when I was uh, almost seven weeks pregnant due to a ruptured ectopic. And it's just not something that's talked about very much yeah. because it's hard to conceptualize. Either it's hard to conceptualize that it was a baby or it's hard to conceptualize how deep and profound that grief is, no matter how old that child is. Yes. And our culture doesn't support recognizing that baby as a child. Mm -hmm. And so right. people will say things like, well, you can have another or at least you didn't get to know them. <laughs> Right, right, which is, oh, God, that's an awful thing to say. <laughs> Absolutely. And parents hear it all the time. Yeah. And that they're on guard. They want to avoid social interactions because they know those comments are coming. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I know I definitely did that too after our loss. I just didn't want to tell people because I didn't want to hear what they had to say because it would just hurt too much. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So given that there's, you know, the culture isn't as supportive of being able to talk about this, it's prime breeding ground for developing myths about grief and grieving around losing a child. What are some common myths that you hear that you can correct for us today? Sure. So probably the biggest one is... So most people have heard of Elizabeth Mm Kubler-Ross that she wrote on death and dying. And she is the one that first outlined the five stages of grief. And our, you know, as a culture, we've taken that and we've taken it and ran with it. And, you know, for many, many years, you know, there's this idea that there are five stages of grief and you go through each stage and it's linear and then you're done. And that is the is probably the biggest myth. Um, and if, you know, I, I would want the listeners, if nothing else, to learn this, that that is not true. There are not five stages of grief that are linear that you get through and you're done. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote those from her observations of people's reaction to hearing that they were going to die, that they had a life limiting illness And that's how they coped with grief through these five stages. And then it ended because the person died. Right. So there was no time for more stages. Exactly. (laughs) They were not meant to describe the person who is trying to cope with their loss. But again, I think as a culture, we like things to be neat, to be, you know, we want to have control. And so what's more attractive than knowing that you have five stages, you can look, you can check off which stage you're at. And then you know you'll be done. We like that, but it's not Mm -hmm. true. So there are no five stages of grief. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for saying that. I'm so, so glad that you brought that up. That is so, so important. There are no five stages of grief. All right, what else have you got? That time doesn't heal. Oh my gosh, yes. I can't tell you how often I say this to people. Thank you, yes. So we we seem to think that if we just wait long enough (laughs) that we're good and that we will heal. I mean, certainly time will allow you to get back into your routine. They will allow you to put your mask on more securely, but it will not heal you. Healing takes work. It takes intention and it takes walking through that fire that we talked about. So as an example, when I described my story and how I, I mean, I certainly cried a lot, but I then got my mask firmly in place. I got into my routine. I was living in fear, mind you, but I was living and having fun. So I had a really strong mask on. And as soon as my son's tragedy happened, that mask came flying off and my grief was right there waiting for me. And that was five years later. So time didn't heal that. It's, yeah, it's, it's exactly what you're saying, that there's a mask you, you create. It's a Band-Aid that gets put on it. And you're just adding Band-Aid on Band-Aid on Band-Aids until you can't see it from the outside anymore that it's still there. Mm-hmm. And it's not until a trigger comes up, like your son's surgery or the anniversary of the loss or hitting the same milestone in another pregnancy, when it, it just comes ripping off and go, here I am. You still haven't dealt with me, so I'm still here. Yes, absolutely. And another myth is that every parent deserves to have grief over their child who died whether you know they just found out they were pregnant um, or they carried to full term or the child lived that w- you deserve to have a reaction to the loss of this child no matter how long you knew them yep. and knew them is a relative term <laughs> right and that there's no pre-assigned period for how long you ought to feel bad right Right. It's your grief journey and it's going to go the way that you need it for as long as you need it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. 
I love that. I love that. I I just, I know those of you that are listening are probably just nodding your heads in agreement or like me and just wanting to shout from the rooftops, thank you, yes, because we hear these things all the time. You should be over it by now. Mm -hmm. Just give it time. You'll feel better. And it's just not true. And I think it's so invalidating to parents when they hear that thinking, oh my gosh, now what's wrong with me? Not only am I still crying, but I'm supposed to be not grieving anymore. And why can't I do that? What's wrong with me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one of the questions that I get a lot, uh-huh. a lot, I, and to be honest, this isn't something that I had expected to get to hear so frequently is what's the best way to grieve the loss of a child? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. And I think the reason it's probably asked so much is because it's not something we talk about. Right. Right. So there's lots of ways to cope with this loss. And part of it is understanding that when you lose a child and 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 so it, it I, I want to make a little bit of a distinction here, because when you lose a child through pregnancy or infancy, it's some of it is a bit different than when you lose an older child. The main difference being that with an older child, you have some concrete things to remember the child by. You have memories that you associate with that child. Um, You've had at least some period of living with that child. So you can rely on some of those things to help you um, cope with that loss or to help to use those things in ritual or in honoring that child. When you've, when the child has died through pregnancy or early in infancy, there many parents are left with nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, some parents don't even have an urn. They don't have anything of their child. They have no pictures. They have nothing. It was as though the child didn't exist. And that's what a lot of parents then struggle with is how do I, how do I move through these milestones in this grief when I don't have anything tangible? So part of the work that I do is helping parents actually create rituals and connections and um, things to honor and connect with their child through because you may not have any of those, any of those typical things. Some parents leave the hospital with a memory box. Some don't even make it to a hospital. So part of helping people grieve is giving them space to actually have all of their feelings, which are gonna include the anger, some of the less, um, the feelings that people don't like to have. So one of the examples I often give in my practice with clients, especially newly bereaved clients, is that you're gonna have a lot of feelings and a lot of them are not gonna be pretty. (laughs) They're gonna be things you're gonna feel really bad about, like when you get invited to your friend's baby shower and you don't wanna go. And you actually feel angry or intensely jealous. And that that's pretty normal to experience. And that doesn't make you a bad person, it doesn't make you a bad friend. So a lot of the grief work is around really having a safe space for all of these feelings so that you can process them through. Because most of us, what happens is we start to have these thoughts and feelings and then we beat ourselves up. And then we try to squash them and then they just fester. And that's not helpful. Right, absolutely. And I think that deserves a little extra attention here. So I just want to repeat what she said, which is, that you want to separate out your feeling from the judgment that you have about the feeling, Mm -hmm. to allow yourself to just feel. And it's not gonna feel great. Sometimes it's just gonna feel downright awful, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's normal, it's okay, and that's what's going to help you heal. Yes. And, you know, sort of piggybacking on the idea of, you know, that, you know, we already established that time doesn't heal. And so the grief process looks like you're taking a few steps forward, a few steps back, a few more forward, a few more back. That's normal. So it's another way that we tend to judge, right? Because, you know, at most often parents find that 
kind of by three months, they're kind of back in their routine and they might actually feel better than they've felt so far. And they might have actually a few days of feeling like, oh, maybe I can cope. And then around the six month time period, parents often, and not always, I mean, these aren't like, you know, set in stone, these timelines certainly, but it's just a trend that we often see that about the six month mark, there's kind of a, an, an increase in emotionality around the loss. And part of, part of it is because your brain is starting to really process the reality of what happened and that it needs that time to actually start to process that. Just as, you know, going from sort of this does not compute to, oh my gosh, this really happened. Right. And so we see kind of a worsening and oftentimes when, you know, people, parents don't understand the grief process, they start to beat themselves up like, oh my gosh, like I'm not, I was doing better and now I'm doing worse. What happened? What did I do? What's wrong with me? Am I going crazy? Why is this happening? Because now I can't even get out of bed. And just last week I was, you know, having fun. And this is all while people around them have mm -hmm. completely moved on. Yes. Absolutely. So you're getting tons of messages from around you going, hey, the world has moved on. Why, what, why can't you? Yes. Yes. And this is Absolutely. why. This is why. That this is the process that you have to go through. And it's very normal for many, many women, men, couples to have these dips in your healing process. That's just part of the process. Yes. And you can expect to have them around um, your due date. Mm -hmm. the baby's first birthday, Mother's Day, um, certain holidays. And so there's often a surge in the grief process. And so it's important for parents to actually prepare for that. Right. If you can anticipate it ahead of time, then you can actually exactly. build up your support team, refill your toolbox so that when it comes, you know you've got the tools necessary to get through it. Yes, definitely. Do men and women grieve differently? Oftentimes they do. So women, and again, this, these are generalizations. It doesn't mean that every single woman is going to do this and every single man is going to do this. But these are generalizations in terms of how women and men's brains are different. Okay, so they are literally structurally different. And women tend to be more comfortable expressing their feelings expressing sort of their tears, their sadness, their longing, um, their guilt. Women tend to be more at ease doing that. And I think that there's also a lot of social expectation that women will do that. But what women do struggle with is the problem solving, sort of the practical, like, how do I deal with X? Like, I got invited to a party. How do I deal with that? Do I go? Do I not go? Most women will just think that they have to go and struggle with the problem solving part of it. And it's important to understand that. And that's where if they have a male partner, that can be really useful because men, on the other hand, tend to be really good at that part. They are naturally geared toward the problem solving, toward the, okay, how do we handle this? But they are less comfortable oftentimes with the emotion. So men will often throw themselves into work and may derive a lot of benefit from work, but then they come home and they may feel wrecked and they may or may not know how to express it with their partner. Women on the other hand may have a bit more struggle with their attention and their concentration and may struggle with kind of how to process those emotions in a way that moves them to a place of purpose and meaning. I love that. I can definitely relate to that. When we lost our first child, um, there was a baby shower that I was invited to, and I just, I knew I didn't want to go. Yeah. I knew I couldn't go. I just, I would be a, a terrible guest at that baby shower. Yeah. But you're right. I, I felt the sense of obligation that, well, she's my friend and I should go. And, and I'll, you know, I'll be honest with you. This still happens to me today because I did not carry to term. And so seeing a woman pregnant after 24 weeks still hurts sometimes. And yeah. especially seeing 
her at a baby shower, which is something I never got, still mm-hmm. hurt sometimes. And and so the, it just shows that this, yeah. the grief, while I've gone through the process and I'm working through it, uh-huh. there are still moments where it does come up. And, and it does help to have my husband kind of brainstorm with me to strategize and go, okay, how can you get out of it? How can you think about it so you won't feel guilty about not going? Mm -hmm. How can you think about your own health and healing as the priority so you know that there's nothing to feel guilty about if you say no? Mm -hmm. And couples can grow together through their grief. And some couples um, struggle more. And part of it is when they, they have a hard time understanding how each person grieves because their grief may look very different on the outside. Right. And there can be a lot of misinterpretation, misunderstanding about why that is. And that's when couples, you know, may tend to struggle more. And it's really important at that point to get some outside support so that the gap doesn't keep getting wider and wider. That's a really great point. And I'm glad you brought that up about at what point should you reach out for support? And this is definitely one of them because you want to make sure that this doesn't impact your relationship long term. Yeah. And I, I imagine this is the case even if it's a, a same sex couple, that mm-hmm. even if it's two women or two men, still two individuals process grief so differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know for us, for my husband and I, what worked after we lost our first was to come up with a keyword or like our own own word Mm -hmm. that was basically that meant I'm feeling it right now. I'm in the thick of it. Just love me right now because I can't do anything else. And that really helped because even if we didn't have the words to describe what that emotion was or what those thoughts were, we just didn't want to get into it at the time. Mm -hmm. That was kind of our way of connecting with each other going, it's happening. So just be with me while I'm going through it. That's beautiful. Lovely. Yeah. So, um, gosh, I, I could chat with you for hours about this. And I know that our listeners have so enjoyed everything that you've had to say for those of you that are listening i hope what you're taking away from this is that your grief journey is yours and no one can define it for you what it looks like how you feel it how long it takes it's yours and nobody else's so honor and embrace the grief that you feel because that's what's going to help you heal Tara, what are your final words of hope for couples who are listening today and are in the thick of it and are grieving the loss of a child? Yeah, that there is light at the end of the tunnel and you are absolutely not alone. There are so many, so many parents that have traveled this journey before you that are traveling it now and that will travel it in the future. And you don't have to do this alone. And you're not expected to know how to do it. Um, There are lots of resources to help you through. And if there's ever a time to give yourself lots of kindness and love and extra help, now would be the time. Because this is life changing. And it is possible for grief to be a journey about self-discovery, not just suffering. I love that. I love that. Where can people find you if they want to know more about the work that you do? Yeah, you can visit my website at www.taramay.com. And on my website, you can access, I have a free gift for you. It's an ebook on um, moving through suffering after pregnancy and child loss. So there's lots of great information. Um, I know we only covered a little bit here. You will get a lot more of that in the ebook. So I invite you to go ahead and claim that if you'd like. So it's www.taramay.com. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for being here today and sharing your story and your wisdom and so much great information for everybody that's listening because there's so many people that experience this in one form or another and I so appreciate you being here and talking with us thank you thank you for having me it was an absolute honor oh my gosh I am I'm shaking in just feeling so moved by this conversation 
it's it's there's just a there's something so magical and so beautiful about having somebody put words to an experience that you feel like you can't talk about that you feel like you're alone in and to just know from somebody who's been there personally who supports people professionally and just to hear those words that you know you think about every night when you go to sleep or when you're wide awake and you know you should be sleeping because you just are feeling it in your bones to know you're not alone to know that this journey is yours there's something so amazing about that I really hope that you feel that empowered too after listening to this. It's your journey. It's your loss. It's your process. No one can define it for you. No one can tell you how long it's going to take and what form and what shape it's going to take because it's yours. So honor it. And embrace that grief that you're feeling because that is what's going to help you ultimately heal. One of my favorite quotes by Desmond Tutu is hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And I hope today's episode has given you that. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you want to know more about how to cope with grief, how to get through pregnancy after loss, or if you'd just like to talk to know more, feel free to schedule a consultation on my website, parijadeshpande.com. Also, I'd love to stay in touch, so follow me on Twitter or Instagram at parijadesh, that's P-A-R-I-J-A-T-D-E-S-H. Nobody wishes to lose a child and it is one of the most awful experiences that any parent can experience and go through but you are not alone there is light on the other side of this but you do have to go through that fire you have to honor embrace it you've got to work through it but i know you can take it one day one step at a time, you can do this.